I'm very excited to be here. I'm a big fan of Semantic Media Wiki. I'm also using it a lot. I'm working a lot with it. I will also show you some examples. But before I start talking about Semantic Media Wiki, I want to start a bit. Back in time. And the title of my talk is Open, also about open scholarly communication and of course related to semantic media. Sorry. PowerPoint is some problem. So open scholarly communication is about um, communication in science. How do scientists, researchers communicate? Um, yeah, great. And um, um, how do we exchange information, knowledge? And this, of course, started very long ago. So um, I was researching a bit on, on Wikipedia, actually, uh, and uh, found out that the first um, like symbols uh, write, written language dates back to 6600 before Christ. Uh, there were these Tiao symbols uh, on prehistoric artifacts uh, which were found in Jiahu, uh, which is a Neolithic Heian culture site in China. Uh, so this is how it started, how we started to exchange information, knowledge using written, written language. And then of course, uh, you all know the hieroglyphs um, from um, ancient Egypt. Uh, so this is an example, uh, the Papyrus of Ani, that's a, a book for death. Uh, so the, um, um, they were writing basically uh, books for people when they died, also giving them advice how to uh, live in the after afterlife. Um, uh, so this dates back to 2,000 years before Christ. Uh, then we have the Greeks, of course, uh, with Plato, this Republic here. This is a fragment of uh, Plato's um, uh, or, or um, um, transcript um, of his. Uh, ideas um, and uh, this dates back to 380 before Christ. Um, then we have in the 12th century publishing uh, this is the Codex Gigas, uh, the largest uh, extant medieval manuscript uh, which was created in a Benedict monastery in Potla Chicha. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, which is in Bohemia, Czech Republic. Um, it's now actually in Sweden uh, because there was the, uh, the war, the Swedish war, and the Swedish emperor, King Gustav Adolf, took it uh, to Stockholm. Um, and uh, this was is famous because um, it also depicted the devil. It has a very uh, nice depiction of the devil. And um, in that century, 12th century monks were basically uh, transcribing and, and writing the books by hand. Uh, then, of course, we had the invention of the printing. Um, and in the 17th century, scientific publishing um, started. So this is a first copy of the uh, philosophical transactions of the Royal Society um, from 1700, no, 1665. Uh, and uh, so one of the first scientific journals which appeared and um, I think that's one of the main aims how we exchange research and scientific findings today. We write articles and we publish them in journals or also conference proceedings. Uh, so here's an example how this looks like. Um, uh, often most of the time they are PDFs. Um, what's the problem of PDFs? It's only partially machine readable. It does not really preserve the structure, it does not embed, uh, allow embedding of semantics, uh, does not facilitate interactivity, dynamicity, repurposing, so there are many problems and actually I would say it hasn't changed much since the very beginning. Yeah? Um, what has changed in terms of distribution of knowledge? Of course, this has changed a lot, right? In the very beginning, we had to transport stones from one point to another, or you had to go to, to see the engravings in the stone. Um, nowadays, we can send PDFs uh, via the internet, so distribution has really dramatically improved over the last um, hundreds and thousands of years. We almost have zero cost of copying and distribution of 
articles of knowledge nowadays. Um, it's a, basically the history of publishing, I would say, is a history of the reduction of the marginal costs of publishing. Yeah? But the main uh, paradigms of publishing, they haven't changed much. Um, uh, in terms of the method which is used to representation, it's still articles are fixed successions of characters and words, uh, relatively static in terms of presentation, content and granularity. Um, and that's how we still work in, in science and I think we should reinvent a bit uh, how scholarly communication, exchange of ideas, knowledge, findings should work. And I think semantic media really can play a really good, uh, important role there. Um, but let's look at it a bit in more detail. So researchers, they spend most of their time encoding findings in articles and then uh, decoding other researchers' findings from articles. Yeah? So we have to find related work, we have to get overview of the state of the art, and this is really cumbersome and time consuming. We have to read a lot of papers, decode, everybody uses different terminology, um, you have to understand what are the differences in the terminology, you have to understand how can you categorize, organize this, and um, it's all in the minds and heads of the researchers, but it's not really made uh, explicit. Sometimes there are, of course, survey articles which try to organize this a bit, uh, but it's really hard to, uh, to do that, and I think it's a waste, a lot of waste of time, and uh, we need to try to develop means to make this more efficient um, and effective uh, scholarly communication. And now, of course, we live in a digital world. We have completely new possibilities. What are the possibilities? We can uh, have really machine readability yeah? and uh, also semantic representation that maybe machines can even understand part of the article. Um, we can have much more dynamic content and interactive examples um, in articles. We can integrate multimedia content. Uh, we can interlink it uh, with context, like related work, calls, reviews, comments, discussions. Of course, currently we also have links, but these are the references. And um, they are quite um, cumbersome, and uh, you still don't have really these hyperlinks, or also the semantics of the links is unclear. And that's what, for example, you have in semantic media, right? You can add the type to a link, and that's what's missing in scientific articles. You don't know is this reference um, a counterexample? Is it supporting your uh, findings? Is it contradicting? Is it a good uh, example, or is it maybe uh, you want to point out a mistake somebody did? All this is basically um, lost or hidden in the text. And then also, of course, metadata um, is. Uh, <coughs> possible to attach provenance, licensing, uh, all this kind of information. Also more interactive collaboration um, in the research community and there are many more uh, possibilities. Uh, what, what can be done now in the digital world and I think we should try to think about how can we reinvent a scholarly communication using all these possibilities. Okay, I have some a bit more information machine readability. I guess most of you know this. Um, PDFs, they lose a lot of the structure of the documents. Uh, if you have, for example, a table, uh, it's really difficult to extract the table, especially if it stretches several pages. The semantics, uh, the columns and the, the rows of the table is basically lost there, yeah, and um, it's very hard and um, difficult to add such information. So, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, he was in the, uh, inventing this five-star scheme. Um, or inventing the um, con conceived this uh, five star scheme uh, to give people in open data a bit in, in, in a way how to proceed from, from raw or, or low level represented data as PDFs, for example. You see here on the bottom the, the lowest star PDF, uh, you get one star, then you publish open data as PDF, um, but um, this is not really machine readable. So if you publish it at X XLS, Excel uh, file, it's already machine readable. Yeah? You can copy and paste at least tables from there and uh, you get already two stars. Um, uh, of course, you always have to attach an open license as well. Yeah? Open license like uh, Creative Commons or um, others. Then once you use a non-proprietary format like CSV, for example, you get three stars. Once you use the RDF data model, you get four stars, and once you actually link it with context and other information, you get five stars. So that's 
Tim Berners-Lee's five-star model. And I think we need something similar maybe also for scholarly communication and uh, express more of the content um, in, in richer, more machine-readable, more semantics-aware and interlinked ways. So how can that work? Um, I want to give you an example. Uh, like, let's look at one paper here. That's one I wrote with Axel Longa a few years ago. And this describes an approach for, for linking RDF or for automatically uh, discovering links between different data sets in RDF. And it would be really good if you could attach such a semantic description, basically. Uh, for example, saying that uh, this paper describes an approach, it's an approach for links discovery, and it has certain properties. For example, it's looseless, which is one important um, characteristic of um, link discovery approaches. And then you could describe that the paper also describes an implementation, that's the second uh, part here, the second four triples. Um, and this implementation is an implementation of this approach, which is also described in the painter, paper, and it's implemented in Java, and you maybe can point to the GitHub uh, repository and uh, uh, to other features the implementation has. And finally, uh, there is an evaluation where you evaluate uh, basically the approach, the implementation, using a certain data set, for example, you could use DBpedia, um, and you evaluate this implementation. And that's a way, a simple example, how you could represent uh, the content in scientific papers in a semantic way. And why would we do that? What would it give us? Um, you could easily generate, for example, a survey of the state of the art because you can basically write a query, um, for example, a Sparkle query, and query for, for all the link discovery approaches, which are useless, which are implemented in a certain programming language, which are evaluated using a certain data set, and you can generate like a comparison of the state of the art in a certain field almost automatically, which is currently extremely cumbersome. Of course, um, how, can we, how can we do that? Um, and we need this, this also rich interlinking. So what I described uh, here is basically internally describing the content of our scientific articles internally, but also externally. There are so many um, aspects. For example, uh, usually you publish a paper uh, in reply to a call for papers. Uh, the calls they have editors or the conferences have chairs. There are proceedings collections where the papers are published. Uh, which are then um, uh, stored at archives, uh, libraries, uh, memory institutions. You have annotations, you have contributors, you have feedback. Also, uh, peer reviews, for example, um, is one important aspect of feedback which you give in scholarly communication. There are meanwhile also some um, uh, journals, for example, which go towards open peer review, so you can actually look at the uh, uh, reviewers and the reviewers even signed by their name, which I think uh, is quite a quite a good approach because you get more credible uh, reviews and also making this uh, space uh, more accessible and and uh, semantically representing and interlinking research with all this context information. I think is is uh, quite important. And I want to show you. Um, an example, of course, of a, a PhD student of mine, Salman Kabadisi, who developed this link research approach, uh, which exactly enables uh, to do that, adding semantics uh, to scientific papers. And then I want to show you some uh, two other wikis. Uh, one is a non-semantic wiki, and the other one is actually a semantic wiki, a media wiki. So, but now about this linked research, how can we create such interactive um, scientific um, uh, articles which use these elements of, um, uh, of our digital opportunities? Um, and here's a bit an overview, um, so uh, how, this, how this works. And on the right hand side up there you see uh, Samen, uh, who actually is implementing and developing that. So you can write and publish articles in a web space. So this uh, also uh, uh, uses standard web technologies as much as possible. Uh, you can annotate and share articles. You can embed live data, scripts, uh, statistics, multimedia. Anyone can clone and remix articles. Um, it's open source, um, and uh, Sauron is heavily developing and working on it. It's actually his uh, PhD thesis. Um, Readers can also choose different views, yeah. So that's also quite important. You can create different 
uh, views, you can print it in a double columnar layout, for example, or in a single column. You can add identifiers, get notified when something changes, and also save articles. And um, um, here is a bit um, overview of, of all the ingredients or what is required. Like we have different technologies which we can use now on the web. Um, we have a number of requirements, uh, some of them I mentioned already, um, like um, uh, publishing and um, public feed integrating feedback, generating different views, uh, then of course linking that with call for papers and so on. And then there are also different stakeholders we should look at, not only researchers, but also reviewers, editors, funders, um, students, um, and at the end also citizens. So I want to show you an example how this works. Or uh, uh, basically a demo, so which was prepared by Sarvin. So here you see an article um, written by uh, us, and this is an HTML article. And um, um, then um, you can basically switch to a different layout. So you see now here, for example, the Springer layout on the right hand side. So by using different CSS style sheets, you can uh, have different views. Uh, now you see here an interactive part in the article. So this is actually a data, statistical data uh, uh, and a, uh, uh, facility where you can run certain queries, create visualizations. Uh, you can log in with your web ID and then you can annotate and add comments directly to the document. And editing also works the same way. You can add licenses. This is then stored um, on an inbox in your, your web space using uh, standard HTML protocols. And uh, this works really decentralized, so it's not only something, if you go back to this, she then sees on her uh, basically version uh, the comment and she can correct that and, and store uh, the corrected article on her, uh, her web space. So that's uh, basically the, to give you a small overview of how this um, uh, linked research works. So the idea is basically using HTML as a representation for uh, articles and then uh, you have a lot of possibilities to integrate semantics using RDFA for example which allows embedding um, semantics into HTML you can embed videos and uh, you also see here on the right hand side for example code example uh, you can run queries directly from the paper so that brings also the conceptual description uh, in this article is a bit closer to the implementation. Um, another interesting feature is the spark lines, uh, which allows to add small queries inside the, uh, um, inside the documents. Um, so you see here we select um, something where we would like to add some um, some query, so GDP for example, and then you have these small inline figures. Um, this is created using a Sparkle query on a Sparkle endpoint in the back end um, and then creates such a small spark line um, directly behind uh, the term or the concept in the article and shows you the development of the GDP for example over time. And that's relatively easy to integrate that. Um, um, of course, you need the Sparkle endpoint and you need the data. But I think this is something which is currently very much debated. How can we link the scientific articles more to the data in the background? And how can we uh, facilitate uh, this um, interaction of, of data and uh, also uh, articles? So the documents are in the end human and machine friendly. Uh, so you can. Um, read them in the web browser, you can print them, uh, but you can also, machines basically can understand a lot of what's going on there. Um, you can add semantic annotations, interactive content I mentioned already, these different views that's very important for um, the research community, for publishers, they want to have precisely their layout, so ACM, LNCS are the standard uh, for example, templates which are used for scientific articles, but you could also create a slideshow directly uh, from, from the article. And it builds on the standard link data platform, so Sarvin is also working closely with Tim Berners-Lee on, on that and tries to build it uh, very close to this um, uh, ideas and the standard web platform basically by not having too much 
proprietary additions um, and using the standard technologies as much as possible. And it's decentralized, so you actually don't need to centralize. You can also all these comments, annotations, and to, uh, through the semantic links between articles, it's really possible to have such a decentralized network of research articles. Yeah, here's, for example, then uh, an example how you can link uh, research to um, a call for contributions and the proceedings. So you can express all this in RDF and then establish these links also using linked research and Dokili. Maybe I skip this overview. Of course, there are a number of other uh, technologies and approaches in that direction which support different of these features um, of um, or requirements for uh, digitizing scholarly communication. Now that's an um, overview of um, um, this um, linked research. And, and now another area, and now I would like to come to something where Semantic Media Wiki comes into play, um, is this uh, open research. So scholarly communication is not only scientific articles, but it's also like metadata about um, article about conferences, about events, about research projects, about tools, about research groups, and so on. There is, for example, um, a lot of um, activity currently going on about research information systems. So every university uh, basically needs something to showcase, to demonstrate what are what kind of research uh, people are doing there. Uh, what papers are they publishing, and so on. And there is one uh, also open system, it's called Vivo, which is developed by a consortium. Um, um, but there are some white spots in the area, so for example events, um, which are a quite crucial element, and it's very difficult to get information about events, about the quality of events, for example, acceptance rate, PC members, about the logistics, about uh, uh, the dates, the calendar, uh, co-located events and so on. And uh, we developed this open uh, research semantic media wiki. So this is now a semantic media wiki installation. And actually we had I had the idea because there was Markus Krotsch, one of the developers of Semantic Media Wiki, who started a semantic media wiki installation at semanticweb.org at the website. And there he had already um, uh, like a um, like a collection or people who created the semantic media wiki installation there, uh, you could add structured information about events, about conferences, and so on. And uh, that inspired uh, me a bit, and I thought we need this not only for the semantic web community, but we need this for the whole research community. And uh, that's why I started this um, five, six, seven years ago uh, as a first attempt. Unfortunately, then. Uh, we didn't uh, continue and uh, we also had a big spamming problem of our MediaWiki installation. Uh, but this year we restarted this activity, we cleaned all the spam and um, um, improved it a lot. And um, just the logo is not yet very nice, hopefully we soon have also a nicer, nicer logo for, for open research. Uh, but now it's online again since a few weeks and, um, uh, and it allows you to browse a lot of metadata about research, about science, uh, according to different categories. So you see here, uh, the first categorization scheme is this field of science, that's what you see here on the top. Um, so there we have, of course, computer science. We want to cover uh, the area of computer science relatively well, and you see a lot of uh, some uh, areas there. This is actually implemented using the category system of uh, MediaWiki. So you have a category computer science and you have categories for um, the sub-areas of computer science. Um, and that's quite important because we can, then can use basically this uh, subsumption reasoning of Semantic MediaWiki to aggregate events. For example, for computer science you will get all the events which are attached uh, or which belong to one of the sub-categories or sub-sub-categories. Yeah? The same thing happens by type of content. Yeah? We have different types of content like conferences, description of conferences, description of workshops, of event series, which are series of conferences or workshops, uh, then projects, research projects, organizations, people, journals, publication calls, and we might add, uh, add more, but currently we focus primarily on conferences, workshops, and event series. And then on the very button, I don't know if you can see it, we have this region. So you can also browse it by region. And that's another classification dimension. So there we have the continents, of course, but then inside the continents we have countries or sometimes even sub 
uh, continents in Europe, we have East, West, Central, South, North. Um, so all the content is um, classified according to these three dimensions, according to one field of science, one type of content, or more, and one, um, or, uh, one region. And then you can basically explore the space and, and look for events, for example, in your proximity, in your area, and you can get a better overview. Of course, it's still work in progress, uh, but we have currently more than 4,000 conferences, um, descriptions or metadata about conferences, I think 400 uh, uh, event series, um, and, and then a lot of, of people who are involved. So if you look at one particular conference, there is, by the way, also one for uh, Semantic Media Wikicon Fall. Uh, you can also uh, find uh, the information on open research now. Um, and here you can find uh, information about the, uh, the dates, for example, when you have to submit papers to this conference, where it's located, um, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. It's use, represented using um, uh, this uh, semantic templates. And we added the semantic forms uh, extension here, so you can relatively easily add um, information um, uh, about uh, events or all these types of content, event series, persons, organizations, um, also the organizers, for example, um, adding them. And what's very important in, um, in research and science is also the number of submitted and accepted papers, so you can calculate acceptance rate um, and then, uh, for example, look at events which have a low acceptance rate, which is one quality indicator. And that's what uh, it allows you then to um, do all kinds of queries over these events. Uh, for example, upcoming events which we have here. Uh, you can order events also by this acceptance rate. That's what you see here. And you see that uh, these are the conferences which have the lowest acceptance rate, for example. And you can also look for events in your region, in your area, in a certain field. Um, you can um, create a calendar. A recent feature, and that's something very important for a research group, usually each research group has something like conferences and events they want to submit papers to or which they want to attend, uh, like a, a conference calendar. And every group does their own calendar. And here you basically can create a calendar for your group very easily. You just have to add uh, the event series you are interested in and then the calendar is basically created automatically. And then for one particular um, conference series, you basically see here um, all the events in the past, uh, who were the chairs of the event, and the, um, what was the acceptance rate, and you can get a good overview of the development of events. We want to now use that, for example, to look, is there a proliferation of scientific articles? There are some people say there is so much junk published, or, or so much papers, uh, there is more and more, basically, because it also gets a bit easier using uh, computers nowadays. And we would like now, after we have a sizable base of um, uh, information on this uh, open research, um, uh, to look how the submitted papers to a number of conferences, for example, developed over time, and then compare this and um, uh, see maybe how uh, the internet or digitalization also influences the scholarly communication. So then the interactive queries, so I don't have to explain this to you, you all know this, how it works, but uh, that allows you to create different views of the content and create different um, perspectives and analyze the data along different perspectives. And then, of course, you can also create uh, person profiles and, um, of course, if you are a member of a certain event, then automatically the event is also listed on your person profile and on the button you have all these facts uh, about um, and a certain resource. This is all available as open data. Um, it's also available via RDF dump or a Sparkle endpoint, so you can also query the Sparkle endpoint and the Sparkle uh, we use Blaze Graph and uh, it's synchronized, so once you see your edit or update content on the semantic media wiki, uh, the information should quickly also show up on this Blaze Graph installation. Okay, this is a second example, and now a third, a third one, and this is a different wiki because I think we also need some other wikis, not only media wiki or semantic media wiki. Uh, but uh, there is also space for, for other more specialized wikis. And this is one which is called SlideWiki. 
Um, it's a wiki for presentations and for slides uh, and for open courseware particularly. Um, so um, the problem, or I saw that many, my impression is many lecturers, professors are reinventing the wheel. They are creating the same kind of lectures. You have, uh, if you study, uh, you have always these basic uh, lectures and at, we have 70 universities in Germany, research universities, uh, never, I don't know, 70 maybe of applied sciences. Worldwide it's like thousands, if not ten thousands of universities and uh, often you need basically the same courses. Yeah? And, uh, there is no facility for easily sharing um, content. Of course, there are a lot of these open courseware initiatives where some universities publish open courses. Uh, but if you look at it, it's also only created by one person or a small group of people. It's not really collaborative. You cannot collaborate. Also, it's often only available in English, uh, not in other languages. It often doesn't contain much. Um, information like um, interactive content or like questions, self-assessment questions. And that was one of the reasons why we de uh, developed this slide wiki. And what I show you now is the old version. It was also started development four or five years ago. We meanwhile this year started a project which will completely redesign and develop a new, more modern architecture. Um, and we hope to release that later this year, but um, it's already uh, in quite good, good shape. Um, but the current SlideWiki version, if you go to slidewiki.org, looks like that. Basically, you see on the left-hand side a tree uh, of a course, um, of a lecture, and e each node is, a, is basically a slide um, in this uh, lecture, and then you see the slide, and you can click into the slide and directly edit the content in the slide. Um, So here you see, for example, the Semantic Web uh, Lecture, which I'm giving uh, every year um, now in Bonn, but my colleagues also give the lecture in Leipzig. Um, and uh, you can see um, that you also can create translations, and that's an important fact. So you have here the lecture translated to lots of different languages. You can even translate them to more languages. Uh, we integrated this Google Translate API, so it basically creates a copy of, the, of all the tree and the slides and then an automatic translation using Google Translate. And of course this has to be revised and refined, but it's much less work, especially when you can crowdsource that in a community of people, um, then you can relatively easily and quickly create translations of, of, of lectures as well. And what you see on the right hand side is that all the contributors are also tracked. So when somebody edits, he automatically is added like in uh, MediaWiki to the list of editors. And of course we also track all the revisions and all the changes. So if someone edits, he never can destroy my lecture, for example, uh, but he creates basically a new revision. But it's a bit more complicated. We were actually thinking a lot about it because here in, in MediaWiki you just have one type of content. That's the article, the wiki text article, right? Here we have um, uh, two or several types of content. So it's not only it's uh, the slides, but it's also the tree because you can rearrange slides in the tree and this is very important. You want to give the lecture in a certain order, right? And order the slides. So this tree is another type of content. So if someone creates a new revision of a slide, he actually also creates a new revision of the tree. Uh, that makes the thing a bit more complicated than uh, in, in MediaWiki. But I hope we have found a, a quite good, uh, good solution um, and um, working on improving that. So, and I want to also show you a, a video. Sorry. <coughs> so a short video, uh, but you can go to slidewiki.org and you can play around with it yourself. So you can. Um, add uh, also remix content. So what you see here is basically that you can um, create uh, a new uh, course based on existing course. You can directly edit inside uh, the web page. You have such an inline editor. Um, you can also add images, um, of course, and um, all kinds of interactive content to the slides, similarly as, uh, as I 
showed you in this uh, link research. You can drag and drop on the left hand side um, in this tree. We also have different basically styles. Um, use this uh, CSS or SAS uh, to create different styles of, and then you can present it. Um, you can switch to the full screen mode and basically present it uh, to the audience. And one important feature is also the self assessment questions. Uh, basically, to every slide, you can attach multiple choice questions. Um, and then um, a learner, a student, can basically test his knowledge, and we can point him also directly to the slides where he answered the questions wrong, and this is the content he should focus on and, and learn in the future. This is also a bit uh, outdated already. The, the version on, on slidewiki.org um, changed a bit, and as I said, um, in the next week's uh, the latest end of the year, uh, there will be a completely new version. The current version is based on uh, LAMP, Linux, Apache, PHP, MySQL, uh, which was six years ago quite good, but uh, we now also had some problems in terms of scalability. I guess uh, you are aware of that uh, MediaWiki and Semantic MediaWiki uh, also sometimes has some issues in that regard. And now we switched uh, to a hopefully more scalable architecture. Um, which is based on CSS and uh, sorry JavaScript and MongoDB as a backend, um, um, and uh, which makes this more more scalable. Yeah. So here were the, the questions again. So I think in a way it's quite different. Of course, many people ask us um, how does this compare to Google Docs, to Crazy, to SlideShare. But I think SlideWiki is uh, completely different because it focuses on this collaboration. So people can work together exactly this wiki approach. Also, it's uh, focusing on e-learning. You can add questions to the slides and uh, comprehensive self-assessment tests can be done. And then also the translation, I think, makes it quite different. We track, actually, when you created the translation, we track what was the translation based on, the original slide. And when the original slide changes, you can get notified and maybe you want to update then your translation as well. And um, uh, keeping track of these uh, different versions in different languages, um, I think, is also something quite, quite different what you don't get in Google Docs, for example, or in SlideShare, where you cannot, uh, you cannot author slides. Yeah, so that um, leads me a bit to the, towards the end of the talk. Um, um, of course, some of the developments and, and all, especially also the Manic Media Wiki thing is very related to semantics and you all have seen this layer cake from 15 years ago. Um, I created a bit a new version of the semantic web layer cake because I think it changed quite a lot in the last years. So we don't have this monolithic here. It's monolithically based on XML, for example, and we have a lot of focus on ontologies and logic uh, above. And I think meanwhile we have more of these lightweight uh, bindings to other technology ecosystems like JSON, for example, with JSON LD. Uh, like to relational databases with R2 RML, uh, to HTML with RDFA, and I think that makes um, RDF um, really like a lingua franca for data integration. And also on the higher levels, there's my impression is there's more focus on lightweight vocabularies. A little semantics goes a long way on SparkQL, um, on uh, RDF schema. Um, and maybe that's a, it's a way how we can have a slower learning curve because I think there are many communities where they don't have, haven't heard much about uh, semantics and RDF. And I think Semantic Media Week is a great tool because you can relatively easily uh, get started and, and um, create semantic content um, and have good, good tool support for that. <coughs> yeah, and for open scholarly communication, I think. Um, uh, we need to invest more time into also authoring environments. I had one idea I had was couldn't we use maybe semantic media wiki also as a backend for this linked research? Could we create articles, scientific articles, uh, directly in something like uh, semantic media wiki um, and interlink that with, with all these other sources of information? Um, and then 
um, research information systems. I think um, Semantic Media Wiki could also be something like a research information system that would be interesting to look and that's something which universities and uh, research institutions increasingly need. A system which shows the wealth of research that people do at these institutions. Often the universities are very distributed, federated with lots of different departments, faculties, and the university as a whole doesn't know what all these people do. And by aggregating this, by describing that, um, uh, it would be possible to give a bit better showcase of the research which is done there. And maybe also developing something like such a five-star publishing of data documents, a course where artifacts, um, which supports also decentralized interlinked publishing of um, research data. Uh, that's a bit what I think there is still a lot of work ahead of us. And I see Semantic Media Wiki has a, a can play here also an important role. Yeah, this concludes my talk, and I of course would like to point to to these two people, Saran Kabadisli, uh, who worked on linked research, and Christoph Lange, who uh, supports and works uh, with me on, on other topics um, like Slavery, and of course there are many more. Um, I forgot to add a, a picture of our group, so there are we are in, in Bonn, a group of 25, 30 uh, people, and uh, this is actually only a very small a part of our work. Um, we work a lot, of course, on semantic technologies in general, but also a lot on other areas like Industry 4.0, for example, is one something very important. How can you use uh, semantic data integration for manufacturing and production? But this is very close to my heart, and uh, maybe we have time for, for questions. Yes. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have question for uh, uh, Professor Howard, please wait. Uh, uh, obviously, open research is a big topic, and, and there's a lot of there seems to be a lot of pushback against open research from publishers and. Uh, and you mean, yeah, open access. Um, open access, yes, yeah. exactly. Sorry, right? Not, not the open research. Place. But uh, of course, yeah, there is our open research, which is openresearch.org, and right. there is, yeah, of course, the open research in general. Sure. Yeah. Um, how, how much of the challenge do you think is technical versus non technical in terms of uh, getting people to, to use systems like this in, uh, to publish their research? I am, but uh, maybe. I have often a view that technology can be very important. Yeah? So if you give people the right tools, then they will use those tools. If they are user-friendly, if they are easy to use, and, um, and that's a bit, from my perspective, how we can convince people I don't, yeah? so that's, I think, a large part is, is, is technical, of, of, and we can uh, create such open platforms, uh, but we have to make them easily usable, user-friendly, and of course open research is also not perfect yet in that regard, so it would be great, our open research platform. If you have ideas how to improve it, um, please create an account and uh, get, get in touch with us or get involved there. So um, Currently it's one uh, PhD student of mine, Zaha Vadati, who, who works on that. I also work a lot on that because I'm really interested in, in, in it and I really like also to work with Semantic Media Wiki. Uh, but yeah, I think we need to improve the tools, the usability, make it easy for people and then um, that's why I see a bit maybe technical technical problems not in terms of that we need a lot of research often or a lot of new technologies. We just need to make existing technologies more usable, user friendly. Um, yeah, and that's uh, that's what from my perspective is important. And then users will come and if the more users use these kind of open alternatives to the closed ones, the more will be a shift or also towards more open research. But of course, there's also the legal side. Maybe if the European Union, I think now they force also in research projects that there is more open access and open data, right? So you can also, of course, do this top down a bit from the uh, from the legislature and from the from the legal societal side. 
Um, yeah, maybe that's also not, not bad actually that everything which is funded by public uh, funding should be also open to the public yeah, and, and not locked in by some publishers. Yeah. Maybe a follow up question is that what part of this technology stack do you think needs more, the most refinement development? <clears throat> Yeah, I think um, we need more maybe tools like for curating data, like semantic media. Because from my perspective, there are not that many tools when you want to curate a data, and, and uh, I don't see there is a protege, there's maybe top rate, uh, there is pool party, um, but it's a handful full of tools. Also, some of them have very specific focus. Um, not many support actually really collaboration of a larger community. I would see semantic media weekly almost in a unique position. And of course, on the one hand, it's good. On the other hand, um, it's also, uh, I think we, we need more more tools. And semantic media weekly in a way has, of course, a lot of ties to media weekly and a lot of inheritance and technology which is related to media weekly. That's why. I think it would be good if there would be some alternatives also, which maybe don't have these ties. Not that I'm not, not happy with the Mandy Media Wiki, but just to give people also, for example, if we talk with companies, often PHP is a problem. Yeah? So we had projects with Daimler and they, were not, uh, they could not deploy PHP applications, especially German companies are a bit conservative in that way. Maybe now with Docker and so on, with these new uh, deployment, uh, technologies it gets a bit more easier but uh, I think it's good if we have technologies for data curation for example semantic data curation uh, in the different uh, also technology and not only in, in PHP and I think there is still not not enough if you look at relational databases you have dozens of relational databases and lots of uh, whole ecosystem around that I think uh, in the semantic technologies area it's, it's still sparse and um, especially this user interfaces and user friendly data curation I think is an area where we need more visualization as well uh, browsing exploration There are not any. There, there's oh, one okay. more over there. Uh, yeah, so um, what I see is that the semantic annotation you are um, using in the system is still a manual annotation, so please have to uh, manually annotate. Um, if you have that written to um, some kind of, I don't know, more logic or more automated annotation, um, I don't know. It's, uh, I think, uh, maybe some things like. On the other hand, it's, it's relatively, it takes like one or two minutes to import, like for example, what we do with over research is a call for papers, basically copy a call for papers, and it uh, doesn't take that much time to add it. Um, my impression is with an automated approach, you would maybe um, uh, reach um, 70, 80 percent of uh, precision, so it would still get 20 percent of the information not right, and then you have to check and uh, revise that, and that takes you almost as much time as uh, the current version of, uh, of it. And then there is, of course, some information. Also, information is a bit spread, so you have some information in the call for papers, and then once the conference was done, for example, or then you have the proceedings, and the number of submitted and accepted papers is usually in the preface of the proceedings, which is published in PDF on some kind of um, repository. So I think it's a bit easy to uh, difficult to automate that really to get this information, and still it would need manual revision afterwards. But we're definitely interested, um, and, and we have this already on our to do list to, to check how good this could work. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.